Hi, my name is Alan Grayeyes, Festival Director for the Sakahiwe Festival. We're working alongside the High Commission of Canada and the United Kingdom to bring you a series of conversations between Indigenous artists in Canada and the trailblazers who have inspired them. Before we begin tonight's episode, I've asked Elder Martha Peet to help us get everything started in a good way. Mata tutkana chak peed mik atakak tonga tunga hirichi tamna ilitaridauna ingirut tunidauti lugu tadvangan tuyang nakti tauro burden coming stakiravianit huli iloani treaty one tamna ilohak tauro madrung nit takurakshak tap kunangan Sakihina we illa kaktairin takurakshanin hulilo tamna aipa high commission kanatami ilitariti logit hitamani ingu chakataktoni tayapkuningan tuhara kataktokshanin hulilo ilitariti logit tapkuningan Ingyoktinig, Ingyoktaksanig, Hana Katakton, Malik Tao Yumakatakto, Tayapkuan, Illo Hertai, Ingyorotin, Malik Tao Yumakatakton, Tayapsumani, Illoani, Ingyorotinig, Hana Rao Katakoni, Tamna Susan Agloka, Inu Yoktunin, Amihunin, Inu Illo. To hear you, my catatang in ing your catatong. Hannah catatong. Malik tell you my running. Cover and a chat, cover your rock in the night and the town, not I'm just outside the Circle of Life Thunderbird House in downtown Winnipeg, which is on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota peoples, along with the homeland of the Metis Nation. Now we're in for a treat tonight because we're gonna kick things off with a live performance of a new and unreleased song by Susan Aglukark. Please sit back and enjoy this episode of Honor Song. Bye. 
What a beautiful song. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, my name is Tiffany Ayalik. I'm Inuk Shuk Makai, and together we are Pelsuk. We're an Inuit throat singing duo out of Canada. And we're originally from the Arctic uh, Yellowknife Northwest Territories region, but we now live in uh, the uh, British Columbia Vancouver region. And um, we're so, so honored to be part of this uh, beautiful project, Honor Song. Um, and we are so, so actually deeply honored to be um, here in conversation, in, in collaboration of sorts with one of our childhood and adulthood heroes, Susan Aluka. And um, we have been following her and admiring her and watching her career ever since we were young, young women and young children, and really. And it is just such an honor to be here in conversation, really, with one of our, our heroes, our Canadian heroes, our Nunavut and Inuit heroes yes. as well. So we are going to turn it over to the amazing Susan Agukop. And if you can introduce yourself, tell us where you're at, and um, that would be awesome. Yeah, Susan Agukop Yunga, Inu Yunga, Akwer Minga Niko Blunga, Akwer Kivalang Mishlumi, Nunavumi, Akwer Ananama, Nunagim Mago, Tekin Ruta Wu. And I moved to Ottawa in 1990 uh, to. Uh, to take a year to work as a translator, uh, no thoughts of uh, artists, uh, path of an artist, I mean, songwriting. Um, and fast forward to today, I've been a very fortunate one to have landed on uh, an incredible career um, that has also been my healer, uh, all the forms of art I practice and that we've been introduced to. Uh, by our elders, by our, our own people. Um, it's just been a privilege uh, to have stumbled into this incredible life and, and always to have beautiful people like you um, to acknowledge it, but to know that uh, we've shared something together. Mm. Susan, we've been bumping into each other over the years, um, I think maybe for longer than we may have remembered until very <laughs> recently. Um, I think you and I met maybe three or four years ago in Yellowknife when you did a show, Yellowknife Northwest Territories, um, when you did a show at uh, NAC, you had yeah. a beautiful concert there. And I think that's when we officially first met. Um, but you and Inukshuk have met many, many years ago. Uh, I'm told that you once babysat me and I, I'm sure you don't remember, I don't remember, but it's <laughs> funny how these things come around. And I remember the first time that I saw you perform live was at the Legislative Assembly in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. And my jaw literally dropped and I saw this uh, beautiful Inuk woman um, performing just beautifully. And it literally changed what I thought was possible for, for Inuit women, um, you know, and changed the way that I thought about my future. So yeah, very, a very powerful and lasting impact was made. Thank, thank, thank you. I remember that one very well because that was the launch of our debut album with EMI. Uh, it was a launch event for this child and uh, we had Which gotten... went trip, trip, oh, plat, oh, plat, no, no. <laughs> But what's funny is um, my parents came down, some family members came down and everybody's working to get the show together. Everybody's busy and I was actually in my room bawling my eyes out because I was so scared because <laughs> you know when you realize that um you know Arctic Rose is one thing the album Arctic Rose was one thing um it was one of those I uh, kind of take it off my bucket list items uh even then the recording and writing of the Arctic Rose album um I I never truly saw myself as possibly uh this artist the singer songwriter uh with something to say and this child changed everything um, and so when the time came to release the album, and you'll relate to this, um, you're really opening yourself, you know, yourself up and making yourself incredibly vulnerable uh, to everybody. And when that hit, it hit hard for me. And I was sitting in my room just bawling, thinking, oh, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do this. And of course, of course I did. 
but I felt bad because I got downstairs to where the makeup artist was and my eyes were so red and puffy. <laughs> like, I hope you can do something about this. And I'm really sorry I did this. Um, but that was a pretty, um, you know, pretty scary and um, major, major event in my life. Um, yeah, I'm glad you were there. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> we, we totally relate to that vulnerability, that opening up of yourself and I, I know there's lots of talk about, you know, you, you aren't what your job is and you aren't your art and, you know, you have to separate yourself from your art. And I think, I think theoretically and logically we can understand why that's important, but I think in practice, it's a totally different thing and it's a harder thing to do in practice because when you, especially how we make art and I know how you make art you put so much of your soul and you put so much of your ex personal experience and your, you know, blood, sweat and tears. And you put so much literally of yourself in something that it's hard to separate yourself after the fact. And when you see something and you hope that people resonate with it, you hope that there's, you know, good reception for the work that you're doing. So it is really hard to, you know, separate yourself Very from vulnerable. your work. Mm -hmm. So you are so vulnerable because it isn't just like, oh, this painting that I made, which is, you know, maybe one way of looking at it. That's maybe somehow separate. I don't know. Maybe I'm not a painter. Maybe that's a bad example. But you no. are, there are little pieces of little threads of yourself in the music. And, you know, we just put out an album um, a few days ago too. And we joke about it that like the build up, the build up, the build up, you know, hustle, hustle, hustle. And then it comes out and then we have a boom <laughs> and, <laughs> and we just drop. It's such mm -hmm. a drop because you feel so vulnerable and like, you know, it's a really, um, it's a, yeah, vulnerability. You're so open and, and we keep doing it. We keep putting ourselves out and we keep opening our chest up every time we do something like this. So, you know, we, we and bounce I, back I and we're okay now, but. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think too, um, I think one of my, my, my greatest takeaways um, throughout my career will be realizing um, that as Indigenous artists, uh, no matter which Indigenous group you represent or you come from, uh, and even if your choice was to be a celebrity for the sake of being a celebrity, you're still an Indigenous artist, um, we're never going to uh, not write honestly, you know. Uh, I think uh, if we write our own music, if we write our own songs, uh, if we create our own art, um, we're going to put into everything we do some of the, well, a truth. There's always a truth. There's always a, a story. Uh, and they're not all good, as we know this. Um, but as Indigenous artists, um, it's, it's what we have to do. You know, so there's the one side as an artist where we're learning uh, the craft. Um, I was not a songwriter when I first started. I had something to say, apparently, <laughs> um, but I was not yet a, a songwriter. Um, and then this child comes out and the mentoring and the nurturing I got from my producer, Chad Urshik, changed everything for me. And I wanted to be a songwriter. Okay, now I get the power of songwriting. Now I understand uh, the power uh, we're given, the opportunity we're given as songwriters um, and always as Indigenous artists. We're gonna go to the stories that need to be told. Um, and that makes us that much more vulnerable. Um, and, and like you said, you're, you're working from the chest, you're working from the heart. So, um, it, you know, on the one hand, it's been a privilege. Um, but also uh, finding the joy of expressing, finding the joy in, I did that, that's my song, I did this piece, I did that, that's mine. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome to be an Indigenous artist in these times. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And there's something too that I think um, we've forgotten how to, have that healthy pride you know in our work and there there is a beauty there is a not a boastful ego me 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 kind of way of looking at it which I think people assume whenever you like I'm proud of this I did a thing I can take some pride in my work 
you know, I feel like we we're, we're bad at that because I think people think, or I think artists think that maybe we're being like too self-involved or, you know, it's like, well, why, why shouldn't we be proud of something we put, we, especially considering the work that we put into something that it's, it's a good model too, for, for other, you know, younger artists or other people to be like, oh, well, Susan's proud of my child. I can be proud of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're taking up a space and that's a beautiful thing that we can have a sort of a healthy pride about and celebrate. Yeah, and, and, you know, and part of what's exciting about um, being the artists in these times, and these times are, um, there's a piece of work we do now, uh, a presentation that we do called Correcting the Narrative. Um, and what that means is um, we've been working for a very long time to tell the stories. What are those stories? Because we did not learn them in school. Uh, my mother has taught us a lot of the traditional ways of the Inuit sewing, uh, seal skin cleaning, cleaning, caribou cleaning, even hunting. Uh, we grew up hunting and fishing. It's just the way that things were done. I think what we've also um, applied to our professional careers, um, public life, is the thing about the Inuit. Um, that just makes you so much more proud is, yeah, I'm proud of my work, but it's kind of cool just to, when I go home, I'm just, yeah, one of David and Dorothy's daughters and, you know, you're in small town Nunavut and you're just one of theirs and nobody treats you like this extra special uh, person uh, with all these things. And that's such an indigenous way. Uh, and it's so healthy, you know. Um, I'm very excited for uh, the next generation, for you, and then for what comes up, because um, we can only lead by example. But sometimes I step back and I, I asked you earlier about your photos. I don't have the courage to do those incredible poses. Like my photographer just tries and tries. I, I can't find it in me to do all these incredible things that you guys do. Um, and I, never liked being photographed in the first place. So it takes a lot for them to talk me into this stuff. But to see the next generation um, coming up and being so bold about it and still being so humble about it, that that's really exciting to watch. Mm. And we <laughs> need to fit from having, um, and I know that you didn't set out to be a role model, but are one nonetheless. Um, and so we had the benefit of having you to look up to and um, we were just talking this morning about that when we saw you on the cover of Chatelaine mm. and, and it like, we were gobsmacked to be like, this, this, this is what can happen. Like, this is real. That's Susan, oh you know, and, and the impact that it had on us was just incredible. And so it's really influenced our goals as artists, um, mm. to see more representation in all mediums, which is happening in an incredible you know, sort of renaissance of Inuit art in all forms. Yeah. Um, so, so what were, who were some artists that influenced your career, your music? Um, my go-tos, uh, there's two for sure, uh, Inuit, uh, that would be my parents. And I, I, I have to, because my father um, was actually an Elvis impersonator. Uh, and his story was pretty, what? yeah, I know, right? Here's a Pentecostal minister who admits he was an Elvis impersonator. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, his story is in the early years of transition. So when they were being moved from traditional way of living to these permanent settlements, um, there was a mine in Rankin Inlet. My dad is from Rankin Inlet, Chesterfield. My mother is from Ahvet, all the Kibadlik region. And my dad says he found this guitar in a trash can and it had three strings on it. So I'm going to give it a try. And he taught himself how to play guitar uh, with three strings. And when he told that story, I thought, oh, I better not fail. I mean, if, <laughs> if they can do what they did with what they had, and I have access to a record label and a promotion company and a management and agencies, so I got all this, I better get this right. But those are the role models who who just did uh, what they did for the pure love of it. My dad loved entertaining. Uh, my mother was an incredible, is an incredible um, artist herself. Uh, she, of course, always performed with my, my dad. But we've been having this conversation, my mother and I, and she's, 
brilliant, brilliant woman. And I was completely floored after a long talk about Ilra. Ilra is Inuktitut for Emotional Fear. So when we talk about generational trauma and what's the work we have to do to feel, peel back these layers, the root of a lot of the emotion uh, of that, uh, besides what we now know, Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the many missing and murdered Indigenous women's choir, what we now know, documented, um, the root, a root is uh, they were effectively institutionalized and ILRA um, kind of had them in their grip. So they were emotionally uh, held back, emotionally afraid to truly engage. Um, and I remember a couple of years ago having this conversation with my mom, and this is the basis of the work we're doing now with the foundation. And she just kind of stepped back and she says, oh, that's the way I felt. And that just told me that we're on the right track with the work we're doing. Uh, for that generation to be so um, institutionalized that way, colonized that way, that she did, could not even acknowledge that this had done, been done to her. She talks now about, uh, okay, I recognize, I remember now my grandmother who had raised her behaving this way. And now I understand why she behaved that way. Uh, so all these little pieces fall into place. So that's actually um, the, the album that we've been trying to release for a while now, um, talks about all of these things. Um, and why we have to correct that narrative, you know? So we've been brought up hearing one story for so long that we think that's the story. Actually, it's not the story. What's the real story? Let's talk about that one. And again, you come back to, lots of songwriting material there. I mean, there's a story, lots of stories that we can create from these conversations. Yeah, there's just so much we've got to do um, and so much we can share and teach as we do them. Yeah. What, what was that word you said about the emotional fear? Uh, so the root word is ilra, I-L-I-R-A. Uh, the word is um, like when I first moved to Ottawa, I always deferred to the white person because well, the white person knows everything. And this is, this is not to, you know, criticize people. The reality is that we felt that way uh, in our early years. So, you know, I was, I emotionally deferred to the person just because they were white. It didn't mean they knew more just because they were white. Okay. I better step back. And I had to, I had to figure out uh, how to assert myself in the life I had landed in, um, the, the career. Uh, and again, the more I learned, the more I wrote, the, the more we share. It's so beautiful to see the, the many forms of resiliency that I think Inuit are so intrinsically linked to that, you know, whether it's your dad learning to play on three strings and I'm sure he tinkered with it and found some sort you know what I mean like there's that that as a resiliency and ingenuity is such a vital vital part of Inuit survival and even though our lives and our circumstances are very different from you know previous generations I really see that ingenuity that resiliency is such a value that so many young people I feel are um, really adopting and have, um, you know, folded into their lives in many different kinds of ways. And I think that especially us like urban Inuit, and I know lots of people are in similar situations as us where, you know, we, we aren't living in, in Inuit land, we're, you know, not necessarily surrounded by extended family, that it's really easy to feel very disconnected from our culture and from community because we're literally not in community in the same way especially during the pandemic especially so. during a pandemic when we're even further isolated mm -hmm. into our little our little groups and um one of the one of a big learning that i think we've been doing um separately and together as as, as sisters as you know in a band together that inuit how you might you know our our ways of being our values and they're translated and translatable into every situation. Mm -hmm. And you don't only have to be, you know, completely fluent in your language and living, you know, up in Nunavut somewhere to be an authentic Inuk. You can be 
abiding by these these values that have kept us alive and kept us thriving forever um, in Vancouver, in in, in Ottawa, anywhere. And yes. that resiliency and ingenuity is, is, I think, the one that keeps coming up for us. The value is still there, even if how it manifests has changed somewhat. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I think I think it's it's an inherent thing because even though we have lived most of our professional lives uh, away from the traditional people, uh, my parents obviously I see I saw very free, very frequently. My grandparents, I didn't get to see as much as I would have liked, um, but even removed from uh, access to that traditional part, um, I find, and the greatest compliment I get uh, with the participants we work with uh, in the foundation is um, the, the way that we share information, uh, which is why for us, by us, is a critical piece. Um, Mm -hmm. like the way that we communicate um, with no anger, with no judgment, uh, it's written in a book actually, um, but it wasn't taught to me. Um, I witnessed it growing up, uh, but even years away from home now, living in Ontario, um, even in the way that I practice, uh, it happens naturally. So it's it's an inherent thing for a few generations, I believe. Right. Practice IQ. Yeah, totally. I remember too, uh, growing up, really noticing how if there was some sort of accident or even just somebody spilled something and it went everywhere, it was just quiet and people would just start to help clean it up quietly. And then contrasting that with visiting family in Ontario and you know, a kid would spill something and it was like, oh my goodness. And, and oh, it's just ruining so the cushions and like, yeah, oh, God, yeah very different. Everybody panic. And... Very different. Yeah. 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 Like we can't unspill it. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mamiana, like, what are you going to, like, you can't go back. You can't, you know, there's a, there's a certain degree of that um, um, acceptance that, you know, well, we can't go back. So there's yes. literally no reason to waste any energy on like wishing we could and just you really know, rooted in just practicality. So practical and how do we, you know, that's that's something that when I feel, um, you know, if something happens to, to like not freak out that it's like, okay, what's the elder version of this? And it's yeah. like a sip of tea and then just <laughs> deal with it and like <laughs> don't have a freak out. Yeah. Well, yeah. speaking of ingenuity and innovation, can you tell us a little bit about what that beautiful um, piece of clothing Atiyi. is behind you? Yes, Atiyi. Um, yeah, so um, I was um, in Cambridge Bay uh, quite a few years ago. We've been back many, many times, but this one particular trip, there's um, in the high school, they also have, a, I believe they call it a culture center and it's all part of the same building. And we went in to take a look at it and they were making things and I'd always wanted one made for myself. So I started asking around um, who, who would be the best person uh, to go to, to make me one of these. And three of the ladies who were the best happened to be working in that culture center in Cambridge Bay. And so I met with them and talked with them and oh my God. Yeah, just to sit in the company of these elders is enough. And then they start, and they're so funny. They're just, they just love things. They just love life so much. So um, I ordered this and I mean, we were talking about it earlier and my mother has shown us ways of measuring, traditional ways of measuring. Um, and they really just literally took one look at me. Okay, we got it. It'll show up in the mail. <laughs> and it did, there it is. It fit perfectly. Like how do you not, measure and this fits perfectly and they, it's just I, it's it's probably one of my favorite keepsakes um next to one my mother and i did a, a beaded project I think. Really, yeah so it was it's just something i cherish because those three elder women uh one has since passed uh, but that i have something from them it's just a it's just a, a, something i cherish so and beautiful. this is something that maybe not a lot of, um, I know that 
not lots of not many Canadians know this, but certainly, you know, if anybody's watching over in Europe, that within Canada, there are very, very diverse groups of Indigenous people and that people and that, you know, Inuit have a completely different set of cultural values and language and and um, you know ways of being geography but then too. even within Inuit there are incredibly diverse um, in yeah. di looking at you know this beautiful atiki behind Susan and that's from the western arctic uh, Cambridge Bay or Ikulukutia in Nunavut in the western arctic the Kitikmi, that's where my family is from and even from community to community you can see somebody who's maybe in Yellowknife, you know, who's not from from Yellowknife, but who's traveled south, traveled south <laughs> <laughs> to go for medical or whatever. And you can know where they're from by looking at their parka mm -hmm. and knowing the shape. And you can say, oh, someone's from the Kibalik, someone's yeah, from, <laughs> you yeah. know. It's true. And you can tell you can tell by their footwear as well. So their coats and their footwear and by the way they talk. So you can hear dialects and what region they're from uh, by the way that they talk. Yeah. 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 It's so incredible diversity. And, and I think that it's um, one of the things that, um, you know, as, as we decolonize ourselves, as we reclaim our cultural um, practices, that even reclaiming the incredible nuance and diversity, I think, is a very big part of that. And um, educating. We get pan indigenized, I find sometimes, like, especially as Inuit. Um, some folks that we meet even in Canada kind of assume that we're all the same. And even I know within First Nation groups, there's so much diversity, so many different languages and rich, rich culture. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I, I think it's important that we are allowed to keep our nuance and to keep the details, you know, even region to region that not so much, I don't see it as something that separates us, but more that identifies us and that we can really lean into in in um, in our identities. Yeah, I think it's um, and so you know what people have what we've been saying for so long uh, that we've occupied our land for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, so when you take a look at uh, traveling, crossing over, traveling from Alaska to Maine, Labrador, and to Greenland. And you take a look at just simply by watching um, the clothing and the way clothing is prepared, the way the animal is hunted. Uh, I remember my dad was getting ready to go out hunting uh, caribou. And so he asks my mom, how do you want me to cut the hooves or the leg part? Um, and my mom instructed him, I need two this way and two that way. And this is traditional knowledge because my dad understands that mom's going to make either mitts or kamik, uh, depending on how that part of the caribou is cut. Uh, and so that's the Kibalik region. In the Kibalik region are seven communities. Out there alone are four Inuit groups. And we look at these little bits and pieces of information in conversation, they kind of fall into your lap. And you think that's traditional knowledge collected over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We hunt one way. Uh, you know, hunting is not just a matter of here's a gun and shoot the animal. Um, so the same uh, region will hunt differently. Alaska will hunt, hunt and fish differently. And this is, this is learned ways of being over thousands of years. Uh, so these pieces are very important pieces to share in school. So this is stuff we have to get in curriculums and put placed in schools. Because once you learn them, it's like you, you, you it kind of like the same analogy as when you, you spill a glass of milk or you can't unspill it. When you learn something, you can't unlearn it. It's a part of you. Um, and you just, you stand up differently. But these are my people. This is the history. This is how they did this. Um, yeah, it's, you know, and, and again, I always come back to art. My mother who was an incredible seamstress and can make everything, everything, anything you ask her, she can make it for you. In this Ilera conversation we were having, she says, so do you think I'm an artist? Mom, <laughs> the things that she's made for us, the things that she's taught us, how to clean seal, how to clean caribou, all that knowledge that she's passed down is a form of art. Um, and 
to lift the burden of have to and make it something that is just pure pleasure was a privilege. And she realized, wow, that's, I'm an artist. Yes, mom, you are an artist. Uh, and the way that you have taught us is, is a again, a traditional way. Um, and it stays with us because of the way that you have taught us these things. Yeah, when you look at the, the clothing designs, it's, it's line, it's function, it's form, it's design, it's how the material lies, what's the function, like it's even the stitching, expression. there's some very complicated stitching uh, to make, like, for example, uh, tuk tuk skin, caribou skin, um, waterproof. Mm -hmm. And like, to, that knowledge is, is so precious. And to see it being passed down, and there's these sewing groups now that are really making a point of passing on these skills. It's just so wonderful to see. And so like, we're seeing, um, you know, Inuit uh, sort of carve out our identity of what it means to be Inuk in 2020. And, you know, what do you see changing for artists today, um, you know, throughout your journey? And what do you hope for the next generation of artists that are up and coming? Um, I, I think we're living in times as a nation, maybe worldwide, where there are indigenous groups, where we have successfully placed um, the, the value and the beauty of indigenous um, ways of being, our stories, our clothing, our dance, our music, our songwriting, um, our way of sharing our songs. Um, so, so forefront. Uh, that what it's allowed uh, all of us to do is, and again, we were talking a bit about it earlier, is I, I create to create now. There is the business side and we have to respect the business side of, of our art, of our work. Um, but that we continue to nurture dreamers uh, and work from the place of dreaming. Um, and create from the place of the dreamer heart, the creator heart. And I think we've successfully done that. I think we have some really incredible, well, there's you, you guys are incredible to watch. I've watched everything you've done. Um, out of Iqaluit is nurturing drama, acting, traditional PC, all these things. Um, young musicians who are making a go at it. It's not easy, as you know, it's not easy in this industry. But I think we've been able to do the first part successfully. It's there now. Now we're, we're at the forefront. Um, people are listening. We have allies. Um, and then my hope is that um, your generation and the next generation just boldly go and continue um, not being afraid to speak truths in our music. It's again, back to what we were talking about. Um, we are indigenous, we, we need to be honest. If we're really going to heal. We have to be honest about everything. Uh, and we do that through art. And there's so many great artists coming up now um, doing the work, all, all art practices. Musicians and songwriters, it's exciting to watch um, young people exploring songwriting. It's very hard actually to write an original song in Inuktitut, um, but that they're doing it. We're finding new words for some, some ways of saying things. Um, it's just exciting to watch. And my hope, and I know it's gonna happen, um, is that they just boldly keep moving forward. And we have Kagiyavut now. I think we need uh, a national organization that supports touring for Indigenous artists. Um, get us out there, get us to perform live, uh, have our own Lilith Fair, for example. Um, I think we need to start looking at how we can create platforms to support them because like I said, it's not an easy business or industry to, to stay in. Uh, so create those opportunities for them to be successful. Uh, and there's a lot of us with enough experience that we can figure this out. And I think we need to do that. And we're so blessed now with, um, even though up north, the internet can still be troublesome, yeah. but I feel like um, having having 
high-ish speeds in, in lots of Nunavut communities has really, really enabled us to create instant community um, and to share knowledge and to share resources and- And humor. And humor. Inuk, Inuk Facebook, fire, man, <laughs> so good. <laughs> and I feel like so much of that collective knowledge is now easier to come by. And I feel like what I'm hoping too for, you know, you know, people who are coming up the line behind us is that we can keep the magic alive, but demystify the process. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's lots of gatekeepers in the music community, in, in just how the whole industry is set up that you, mm -hmm. you have your labels, your managers, you know, um, things that on the outside are supposed to be supporting the artist, but also exploit the artist at the same time because we don't know. And I feel like we can be, um, not a lot of artists are also great business people. So I hope that as, you know, as this information is, is shared more readily and, and um, artists learn how to be good, not only masters of their, their art and their voice, but also have enough knowledge to know how to not be taken advantage of. I feel like that is another leap that I want so many Inuit to um, to be able to benefit from because I feel like like how you were mentioning Susan if there's a confident white person in a sort of powerful role a lot of us will defer to you know that sort of fear of like oh well you must know better because you've been doing this forever that I hope that that um, young people coming up now too can have the confidence and the education and the um, the tools that they need to be cutting out all these middlemen and middle people who um, aren't serving the art and aren't serving the voice or the message. So I, mm -hmm. I really hope that that's coming up next because I feel like it's possible now because we can meet and chat and share experiences mm -hmm. and you know we can help to demystify the industry. Um, and the more people see that, uh, the more that messaging is consistent, that there's Inuit making decisions, that we're deciding how we want to do our art and how we want to distribute our art. That will help to combat um, sort of the lifetime barrage of other messaging that, you know, that we need non-Inuit to tell us how to do this and when to do this, mm. uh, and, you know, sometimes even why to do this. Mm. And uh, I know for us growing up, like we've had so many discussions about you know, how your self image forms. And sometimes it forms in ways that you're not super conscious of um, just by the, the constant daily, you know, Micro. small messaging that you receive. And so I hope that for the next generation, it's not gonna be um, an overwhelming amount that they have to fight against that says, you know, here's the reasons why you can't do this. And here's the reasons why you're just really going to struggle. And here's the reasons why you're at a disadvantage and that they're going to have that other side of the arrow come together and say, but here's why you can, you know, yeah, this stuff is true. This is what you're up against, but here's how you can, here's why you can. And here's people, you know, blazing that trail, how you have for us uh, saying, you know, here, this is proof that you can do this. You know, you can, be that arrow and you can pierce through into the future that will be full of health and well-being for, for all you need. And isn't isn't that one of the ways that we decolonize? Yeah. You know, the more informed, empowered, uh, and fearless we are in the pursuit of our dreams and the pursuit of, of something better for the future, the more we are peeling back the layers. Exactly. Um, yeah. 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 Instead of why you, why not? Why not you? <laughs> why not you? Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, there's, there's, an um, art. you know, this has been, um, oh. go ahead. No, no, you, you go, please. Uh, no, I was just thinking about this one artist um, who's made a go at it and then kind of disappears and comes back at it. And I, I just root for him every time he comes back and I send him notes to say, you're doing good, keep writing, just keep at it. Um, and, you know, 
the choice uh, for him is to work out of his community. And we can't discourage that. We can't, we can't discourage that. Uh, so we have to figure out how to support them if that's, if that's what they need to do. Uh, because um, why not? Like you said, why not? Why, why can't they um, have a successful career uh, living in, in a place where they are most comfortable to live and create and be? Uh, so I always come back to this young man who's, who's working so hard to, to be, uh, he's a great guitar player and a great singer and he's a really good songwriter. So th that's the stuff that gives, gives me hope uh, that we're, we're all on the right track. Yeah. And I think too that even within our own communities, even within Inuit communities, to see that our decolonizing Inuit art, what is Inuk art? What is Inuit music? What is Inuit visual art? Mm -hmm. That, you know, there's a beautiful blend of traditional, of futuristic, of you know, um, blending the old and the new, the future and the past, and people in line with ingenuity, experimenting, you know, you know, all, all of these other aspects of um, cultural values that we've grown up with, that those are the next manifestations of, of Inuit art. Mm. And people are doing wacky, amazing, creative, out there things. And um, I've, I hope that Inuit communities, as they have been over the last, you know, while, are more open to that as well, to, to recognize, oh, just because this isn't how I would do it, I can support this person and celebrate the, the ingenuity and the bravery and, you know, whatever that they're doing, and that this is still Inuit art, because I feel like a lot of non-Inuit audiences um, also put us in boxes of what they think Inuit art is and you know it's no less authentic for Susan Aglukop to be singing you know poppy country chart chart topping music and that's still Inuit chart topping music it doesn't have to be with a skin drum singing ayaya pisi songs for it yeah. to be any less authentic mm -hmm. and that this is the beautiful reimaginings of us as people and how we are expressing ourselves and it is still authentic and true and real. And um, it has to be changing and flexible or else you know, we aren't gonna do art anymore. It has to, we have to have a, that space um, to express or we'll stop expressing. Well, exactly. I, I think that's really what it comes down to is um, we think, and it is, I mean, again, I will always be grateful for the life I landed on, um, but um, even more grateful that um, it was also my healer, you know. Uh, I've only come to understand that, I would say in the last five or six years, that actually what I've been doing for the last 27 years is expressing, uh, is expressing um, memories and stories and things through songwriting and through all the other art we do. Um, and I think as long as we keep um, our up and coming, I, I'm, I, I'm always, like I said, I, I'm always stunned by your photos and your boldness in your photography, Inukshuk, and I just love watching the images that you guys create uh, and share uh, and that you utilize all these things in Inuit culture and make it contemporary. Um, but, I mean, if I were to ask you, how did it feel to see one of your photos uh, in, in um, to see one of your photos, how, would that, how did that feel for you, Inukshuk? I mean, we played around with photography since we were children and I was always the one behind the camera and the, a lot more shy. <laughs> and Tiff was always super outgoing and wearing crowns and helped to get me out of my shell. And I, I was always sort of thoughtfully, logistically planning how things needed to happen. And so we just made this beautiful team um, and our relationship is just one of the absolute joys of my lifetime mm -hmm. uh, to together and to balance each other and so to to photograph us is just my one of my most favorite things um, to sort of capture a snapshot in time of our relationship and our career and yeah. our dreams coming true 
it's, it, it really feels like that in that moment you can just see like that that's a little snapshot of our dreams coming true <laughs> and at the same time I'm like oh this is us as little girls playing, <laughs> playing dress up you know and like this is something we've always joked about as kids of like let's start a throat singing band yeah and, you know uh, as we'd be little, camping as kids. little kids yeah. we've been doing this for so long mm-hmm. and to recognize that you know, as artists, like one of our biggest, like, um, tools in our weapons is to just remember how to play. Mm-hmm. It's so simple, you know, and so healing, and so healing. Yeah. And just there's a beauty in the play and, and the experiment and not having to control everything and that you can just play and have that listening and like, playing like kids how kids play now let's try this let's try this you know what if we did this you know kids do that all the time and it's kids are sometimes the best collaborators and you know like that attitude is is how we love to approach our work yeah and do you find uh, so so when when you do when you started the photography um and then there was that piece that was being used and it just gives you this 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 new courage, you know, okay, that's, that's mine. I did that. And you get this new courage, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and you go, Oh, I did that. I can, I can do more. I can. And then you're less afraid to try new things. Um, and I, I, I really think that we're living in some pretty incredible times again, as indigenous artists, where we have so many who are boldly trying, uh, we have to create those platforms where let's, let's figure out how they become successful enough that so they keep trying. Uh, so that they keep working at it. They give them the opportunities they need um, to do, have those aha moments. I, I did that. I'm gonna, I can do better next time, that kind of a thing. But yeah, I mean, we're again, back to, we're living in some pretty awesome times as indigenous artists. Yeah, and the re- that representation that we just keep touching on, speaking of that, for any of our viewers who are looking to learn more um, about Indigenous people, about Inuit people, from Indigenous and Inuit people. Uh, what are some books and movies that folks can check out? Um, I highly, highly recommend um, One Day in the Life of Noah Piogakto. And, and that's a film? Beautiful film directed by Zacharias Kunuk, who is a legend, a titan, a master storyteller. Um, beautiful, beautiful movie. And um, an incredible snapshot in time of Inuit life as it comes to a crossroads. And I don't want to give away too much more than that, but um, if you have a chance to see any of his movies, they are um, beautiful depictions and fully from an Inuit lens in front of behind the camera um, way of experiencing um, Inuit life in a very authentic way. Also highly recommend uh, Angry Inuk, uh, it's a film. Uh, it's a, I think it's available on iTunes now. I think so. Um, directed um, by Alethea Anako Farrell. And when we were in Germany in February, we were we were at a film festival, and were approached by a group of viewers who said that the film literally changed their entire outlook of of hunting, of sealing, of Inuit, uh, which is just absolutely fantastic to hear. I definitely recommend checking that one out. Any films, Susan, you think people should be watching? Um, the one I've seen recently, and oh, it just, it just depicts life in the North so beautifully, is the one that was shot in, um, is it called Lok Dok? Um, oh, the, the, the Grizzlies? Yeah, the Grizzlies. Mm. Oh. Yeah, Gorgeous. and the way that it, the way that it tells the story of the struggles of our youth in in our in our environment, um, and acted by them, you know, again for us by us, we tell the stories the way they need to be told. Um, it was just so beautifully done that that was the most recent one that I have seen that I just it, it, as yeah as sad as it was, um, I actually I felt some hope as an artist that we're we're utilizing all these different forms of sharing. Uh, the way they need to be utilized right now. And that, that, that just gave me a lot of hope. Yeah. Any, any books that uh, we should be directing people to? I know, um, I know a great book called yeah. Una Huna 
by <laughs> the esteemed Dr. Aglukok that people <laughs> should be <laughs> checking out. Yeah, so Unahuna is a, a very specific Akwea dialect for what is this? Um, and she's a six part series. We just finished the second part um, delayed due to COVID. Um, and it's really just telling the story of change through the eyes of a child. Uh, so that would be the transition between traditional and into permanent settlements through the eyes of a child. And um, inspired by stories my mother would share about her childhood with her girlfriend and how some moments would have been just ridiculously funny. Like just some of those moments, they were just laughing on the floor funny. Um, and just sharing that um, through this child's eyes, but also walk away lessons uh, back to Ilira. Had things been done differently, um, how different would we be now? You know, and it challenges that question uh, through the eyes of a child. Mm. Any books? Yeah, I always recommend Inuit Kayumayu Tokangi, What Inuit Have Always Known to Be True, um, edited by Joe Kahitak, Shirley Takalik, and uh, Frank Tester. And it's put out by Fernwood Publishing. And it's just a brilliant snapshot of the transition that Inuit went through, like a little bit what you're saying there too, um, from living how we used to on the land and then moving into settlements and just the policies and the, the foreign policies and how that impacted, you know, our, our child raising, it impacted, you know, our, our hunting, our, our relationship with the land, with the animals. And it's just a, a wonderful, it also is just full, chock full of traditional knowledge from inter interviews with elders gathered over 10 years. And it's just a brilliant piece of literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I also um, am currently reading Land, Water, Sky by Catalia Lafferty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I definitely recommend check that out. That's new. It just it just became available internationally. And she's an up and coming artist uh, who is actually from Yellowknife from as Yellow well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think people are, there's going to be comments um, throughout the, uh, on the different broadcast platforms. So you can, you can follow, you can find the links to, to these. Um, to just, you know, keep, yeah. keep up to date, to learn something new maybe, and um, to be supporting Indigenous voices in different mediums. So there's lots out there. So are you performing for us now? Uh, we're sharing a performance. Ah. We're, <laughs> we, um, we wrote a new song, um, and we were able to perform it um, in a beautiful venue um, in Vancouver called the Christchurch Cathedral um, in, in downtown Vancouver. And um, it actually is the first church that I've uh, heard about that um, has a, a dedicated, um, um, what's the word, vision and um, commitment to reconciliation and following the, the recommendations by the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, for engaging and being, um, you know, accountable to Indigenous people. And that's really, you know, I think people apologize a lot about what happened, but then to see institutions, especially religious institutions, who are actively trying to repair relationships and be accountable for the ways in which they contributed to um, colonization and oppression of Inuit is um, like a really beautiful thing to see. And, and one of the reasons why we wanted to, to film in, in that church because we felt safe to do so there mm -hmm. and that we could be practicing our culture in a way um, with in a building that, that supported that. So we, um, we're very happy to share um, our, our new track with you that we did there. Mm. I can't wait to hear it. Konmoyok? Yes, ascend or ascension. Konmoyok in my dialect. Okay. I can't wait to see this. Thank you. 
So that is our new one. Yes. Well, thank you very much, um, Tiffany and Inukshuk Yatsuk, uh, for uh, selecting me to be part of this, this great event. Um, thank you for the work you're doing and that you will continue to do. Um, it, as I said, it gives us a great deal of pride uh, to see the younger ones just running with running with what you're running with, your creativity and your boldness and, and everything that you do. Um, I don't think we could even thanks doesn't cover it. It's just it just gives us a lot of pride to see all the work that you guys are doing. So thank you uh, for sharing that and for sharing this afternoon with me. Thank you so much. It was an absolute honor uh, to be able to pay tribute to your career and to the person that you've been to so many of us. And uh, thank you so much for blazing that trail and for helping us to believe that we could follow our dreams as well. And we're not alone. We're one of many, many people we know in our generation who think and feel the same and who have been impacted just as deeply as we have been and are taking that impact into different areas of their lives, whether they're artists or not. And um, we're, we're so honored to, um, you know, count you as one of our peers as well. And that, you know, we're um, very, very, very touched that we're um, being asked to participate in something like this because it, to us that maybe it means that we're also having an impact for other people mm -hmm. and to know that um, that's a responsibility and a joy that we feel um, to be able to inspire other people is is so so deep and so profound for us because we know what it feels like <laughs> coming from you also so kwana uh, matna thank you so much and a huge thank you to um, the high commission and to all the amazing people at Sekiwe who work so hard behind the scenes to make all of this happen and um, all of the, the unseen and unheard tech people who make these things run so smoothly. We're so, so thankful to you as well, Kwana. And um, any any last farewells? Anything else? We're just over the moon right now, floating on air. Like, we just got to have coffee with Susan for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> literal right. like tick tick <laughs> yes thank you and we will see you for sure again out there somewhere on the road thank you yeah, thanks. stay safe bye bye yeah.